William Afton, the main antagonist of the FNAF series, the purple guy, the man behind the slaughter, the breaker of chains, the mother of dragons. But that's in his world, in the games and in the books. But how dangerous would William Afton be in our world? It's a question I've been asking myself for a while, like for two days, and it's something that I plan on answering in this video. Greetings gamers and welcome back to Top 10 Gaming. I'm Connor Monroe, and this is How Dangerous Would William Afton Be? I wanted it to be how deadly would he be, but the YouTube. Well, going by real world standards, it's difficult to say, since obviously this isn't the world of Five Nights at Freddy's, and I wasn't alive in the 80s when the original killings take place. However, if William did not have access to the technology that he does in the games, he would probably have done significantly less damage. Firstly, his children probably wouldn't have perished, since they both died due to animatronics that were way outside the norm. Since, you know, Baby literally scooped Elizabeth using a big claw that was hidden inside her and then kept her inside of a chamber, and Crying Child was killed when Fredbear crushed his skull, which would require an absurd amount of force which would be impossible to realistically find for an animatronic, especially in the 80s, since FNAF 4 does take place in 1983, meaning all three of his kids would be alive, potentially resulting in less of a death Told, since putting Crying Child back together ended up becoming a driving force behind why William continued to kill. Since while the missing children's incident wasn't until 1985 supposedly, Baby was designed to grab kids long before since Elizabeth's room was empty in FNAF 4, indicating that she was already scooped by Baby, so he would have had to at least have the idea to kill before 1983. It's, it's a... Cause you know. We still don't know why he started killing. As for how successful he would be if his kids weren't a driving force, that depends. One of the most well-known serial killers is Ted Bundy, who ended up admitting 230 killings over the course of four years. And I'm sure we all know the story of how he used his looks and charisma to win over various victims and society, but I feel like we can kind of compare this to William. He is in essence doing the same thing, using that Bonnie suit to win over his victims and lure them to the back room when he would then take their life. He was also able to avoid the cops despite being arrested, like we learned from the newspaper clippings in FNAF 1, because he was arrested but released due to the bodies never being found, even though animatronics were leaking mucus and blood. So needless to say, while yes he would be limited with technology, he would still be able to kill, but I guess in the old fashioned way, which sounds absolutely horrible. However, what would the cops have done? I feel like they wouldn't have been as bad as the cops from the FNAF universe, like the cops in our world wouldn't have been as bad, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Like, the suits ended up leaking mucus and blood, and it was definitely reported to the police. Again, as we see in the newspaper clippings from FNAF 1, the parents who called it in even akin to the animatronics to reanimated carcasses, which I mean, does make sense given that they were possessed, but even in our world, if someone called that in, I feel like there would be an investigation. And while the animatronics wouldn't have been possessed in our world, like since like I've said before, possession isn't real, but if there is an ongoing investigation or even a closed investigation where bodies were not located, and then there are things in the investigated establishment that are leaking blood, I think that calls for the case to be reopened, or at least someone to go check it out. Somehow though, they either didn't investigate or they did, but didn't find a body inside the animatronic, which is highly unlikely because, you know, the, there would still at least be bones. So I'm pretty sure that they just didn't investigate. However, I'd like to think that in our world, they would have been investigated and found the bodies, thus resulting in William being arrested, convicted, and only the original six victims having died. Nobody else would have died, and William would have been arrested. At least, I think he would. Obviously, I can't predict the jury, and I can't predict how the verdict would have happened, since, you know, Ted Bundy was also arrested, and he had a trial that managed to evade police for ages. So, who f knows at this point. There we have it, friends. How dangerous would William Afton be? Not as dangerous, hopefully, since he wouldn't have access to the same technology that he would have in his universe, and hopefully our cops would have been more competent. I'm still mad about those. What other questions should I answer, be it FNAF related or gaming related in general? Be sure you let me know down in the comments. I'm definitely thinking maybe uh, something along the lines of why the doors don't work properly. Okay, not really, but like, you have to admit, 
The doors make no sense. I don't care if you say, oh, it's electromagnets. No, that's not how they work. They require electricity to actually, like, magnetize things. So it would, it would be the opposite. If they had power, the doors would be up. So, like, my point still stands. And then everyone's like, oh, it's for safety so that you don't get locked in. That room would have a window. It would have a window. Oh, oh back. It, it, so you could escape if there was a fire. I'm pretty sure that's required by law. That there would have to be a window there. So, why don't the doors work? I don't know. Honestly, I can't answer that question. Because I would just rant the whole time. And it would just be a 20 minute video of me ranting. But honestly, um, it feels like that's something that you guys enjoy. Because you're still here watching this part. At least, I hope, at the very least. We know that the FNAF multiverse is a thing. Hell, it was the topic of a previous video. But what if instead of us being in the FNAF world, Afton somehow managed to get into our world? Well, he might have already done it. And the implications of such are what we're exploring today. So, in the words of Rhett and Link, let's talk about that. This idea came to me thanks to the Freddy and Friends on tour episode 4 glitches that ended up revealing glitch trap when you assembled them like a puzzle. Which I found out on my own despite people in the comments claiming someone on Reddit already did it. I couldn't find the post when I saw these comments, okay? So, in my mind, I did it first. Anyways, this made me think about just what abilities Glitchtrap could have now that he's sentient code that uh, can apparently possess people who put on a VR headset. And honestly, I think with that ability to possess people as code, not even as a spirit, just as code, makes him literally able to do anything. But if we want to keep at least some element of realism, we can say that he can possess people, but he would have to return to the game. He couldn't go directly from a person to something else, which would kind of make sense. Now, how could Glitch Trap operate post FNAF VR and prior to the release of Security Breach, since this theory doesn't really involve that game? Well, let's work backwards. What could cause Glitch Trap to appear in Freddy and Friends on Tour? Well, that show is clearly a riff on the Fred Bear and Friends on Tour show that we saw hinted at in FNAF 4 on the TV. The same easter egg that gave us the date of the game of 1983. And if we think about this and how it coincides with the Many Worlds interpretation, every possibility does exist. The earth where the show is called Freddy and Friends also exists. This could be a way of signifying that this is in fact another earth, since both shows seem to have a similar theme, with Fred Bear in the original case interacting with Foxy, and then clips of the various characters singing and performing which follows the plot structure of the Freddy and Friends episodes with characters running away from Foxy and then ultimately performing, eventually performing with him in the final episode. It's also worth mentioning that while we expected six episodes revealing all six numbers of the release date with the final two being Roxy and Monty, we didn't get those. We got four episodes stopping when the last animatronic from the original gang was in the thumbnail, meaning that there may not be anyone else, at least at the time. It's also worth noting that the website showcasing the latest episode secured SecurityBreachTV.com also has hidden messages around the desk if you hover your mouse in certain areas, with the majority of the screen being be careful, hovering over the phone saying I thought I heard something, the Steel Wool Studios logo saying we know all, and the button to play the latest episode just having question marks. These are things that remind me of how psychic friend Fredbear would speak to us in the minigames for FNAF 4, only further solidifying the FNAF 4 connection. And you know, since I said it, I have to do it. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Everywhere, who are you gonna call? Psychic Fred Fred Bear. So if this is FNAF 4's Fredbear and Friends cartoon, what would that mean? Well, my idea is like that of an old theory of mine, that the FNAF multiverse is beginning to expand as the release of Security Breach and ultimately the Fazbear Fan vs. Initiative games draw closer. The Fazbear Fan vs. Initiative, if you don't know or remember, being a collection of fan games that Scott funded so that they could get new installments or versions, along with helping the creators with merchandising and porting the new games into consoles and getting them on store shelves, which is incredibly generous. He was also staying out of the development process so that they could make the games they wanted. The games included our Five Nights at Candy's 4, The Joy of Creation Ignited Collection, Pop Goes Evergreen, One Night at Flumpty's 3, and Five Nights at Freddy's Plus, which is a reimagining of the original FNAF game. Which is where I'm guessing this universe's timeline starts or builds off of, considering how Five Nights at Candy's relies on the FNAF story for its own story. The most notable one for me 
personally, out of all of these games, is the joy of creation. And those of you familiar with the game may already know why. In the joy of creation, you play as Scott Cawthon and his family as they try and survive real life FNAF animatronics, known as the Ignited Animatronics. These are drawn to the house thanks to another character coming from the games, Michael. And since that game takes place in our world, in the real world, I think the groundwork is being laid for that story now. This game specifically needs to be remade since the assets that were used in the original were copywritten and found in the Steam library, etc. So they have to remake all the assets already. So remaking the story so Scott doesn't quit after FNAF 2 and instead retires before Security Breach is entirely in the cards. This game is also the outlier, the one that takes place in a world where FNAF is a game and not real, unlike Five Nights at Candy's. So making the world that game takes place in be this world would also be astounding for marketing. Scott retiring may not have actually been because he's tired of making games that aren't for his kids, or because of the whole donating to anti-LGBTQ plus politicians. It could have been pre-planned, and Scott used his cancellation as a way to get more eyes on his retirement. Since the story revolves around Scott retiring, and he now has, it's entirely possible that this game gets updated to involve this drama, especially because the animatronics and Michael will need a way to get out of the games. But how could they do that? It's extremely unrealistic, right? Like, how could game code suddenly break out of their game into our world and become sentient? You see where I'm going with this? Glitch trap. He is the reason. He's the key to how this story could realistically, albeit somewhat unrealistically, work. Glitchtrap being sentient code from the main FNAF universe could use his control over the games and code to basically pull these characters out and put them into real endoskeletons or microchips and send them after Scott. And he could be testing these abilities. Hence why Freddy and Friends is different to Fredbear and Friends, because he can't pull things over perfectly, which in turn would help explain the ignited forms of the animatronics. It also explains all the glitches in the episodes, with the other world, the actual FNAF world, breaking through. Hence why the scenes we see glitched through are actually taken directly from the trailers. And the only glitch that wasn't in the trailer? The glitch trap puzzle. But how could he have gotten here? How could glitch trap have gotten from his universe onto our YouTube? It's simple. Us. YouTubers like me who have played through the oh so famous FNAF VR. Since what happens at the end of the game when you collect all 16 tapes? You get assimilated by glitch trap and merge with him no matter what you do. And then where do you end up uploading the footage of you getting merged to? YouTube. Where did Glitchtrap pull the episodes of Fredbear and Friends to that caused them to get slightly modified because this isn't 1983? YouTube. We as the player of FNAF VR and then the YouTubers uploading the gameplay managed to get Glitchtrap onto our YouTube. And as such, he is now able to be the link between the universes letting Joy of Creation Ignited Collection to be updated and based on our real world. I personally don't think that Scott was really retiring. I believe that at least it started out as that plan, but maybe now he enjoys the life so he may just stick to it. Who knows? Well, only Scott. And uh, Scott Cawthon isn't known for talking clearly. William Afton, the man behind the slaughter. In the novels, he searches for the key to everlasting life. And in the games, well, he seems to have found it. But is that really the case? Or has William gotten himself into a bit of a paradox? That's what we're exploring today. Greetings gamers and welcome back to life's biggest FNAF questions. I'm Connor Monroe and today we ask, is William Afton still alive? And by, I mean alive in like a tangible sense, considering how at the moment he is sentient code. Okay, let's do this. The main question we need to ask is what counts as being alive? Because since maybe even the first game, William has been possessed by the one you should not have killed. One of his victims that ends up possessing him rather than an animatronic. So he's survived quite a lot that would have normally killed him. The Oxford Dictionary defines being alive as quote, living, not dead. Which, I mean, is fairly obvious, but I was hoping for something with a, a little more meat so that I could maybe find a loophole. But by the dictionary definition of alive, 
No, William Afton is not alive. We are vividly described his explosive death in The Man in Room 1280, the final story from the fifth Fast Bear Frights book, Bunny Call. But that's not why you clicked on this video. You clicked so that you could yell at me in the comments saying, of course he's alive. This video is pointless. Why did you do this? So maybe there's a way that I can get this video to 10 minutes after all. I mean, we could consider keeping the memory of someone alive being alive. Since after all, Henry does his damnedest to make sure that everyone forgets what William did in the FNAF 6 ending, saying, quote, This place will not be remembered, and the memory of everything that started this can finally begin to fade away, as the agony of any tragedy should. But we know the memory doesn't fade, since even after the simulated pizzeria burns down, Fastbear Entertainment is still kicking and still uses what William did to make profit and even strengthen their brand. Like how hotels will make their entire brand about being haunted if enough people say that it is. Like like the Queen Mary or even the Farhampton Inn from How I Met Your Mother. They made a whole virtual reality game revolving around William's axe, which features an AI version of him in the form of Springtrap, not even talking about the spirit code version of Glitchtrap. And with the special delivery service, they are also actively shipping out recreations of Springtrap to everyone, even going so far as to make alternate versions like Toxic Springtrap, Clown Springtrap, and The Curse, which I have to admit is probably the most fitting name for the Fazbear Entertainment to give this character. But to them, it isn't a character. He's a real person, a real serial killer. That's like shipping out robotic versions of Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy to parents and kids. I say especially him because Clown Springtrap is definitely inspired by John Wayne Gacy and you know, the similar target of kids. But I mean like, how incredibly offensive would that be if a company did that in our world? They would be instantly cancelled and even investigated to see if that was meant to be a warning or some kind of threat, but from what we know, nothing of the sort has happened to Fazbear Entertainment. And let's be honest, I don't think the Oxford Dictionary takes into account extreme agony possession as a contributing factor when talking about how someone is alive. So does being a sentient AI count as being alive? Well, it depends on the person and their personal definition of being alive. While sentient AI would probably be able to feel and go through some of the living process, such as emotion and whatnot, an AI, sentient or not, has no DNA. It has no cellular structure and doesn't undergo the process of cellular division and replication. It can't heal a wound, I mean it can't really be damaged. Sentience is the capacity to be aware of feelings and sensations, not to actually be a living organism. Even if they have a body, like one of the animatronics from the games, those aren't alive, despite being aware that they're possessed. Possession isn't living, so no, still, William isn't alive. Now the really tricky thing to determine is if possessing a living being, as William does with Vanny, would count as being alive. And for this, I feel like we need to look at DID. Dissociative Identity Disorder, formerly known as Multiple Personality Disorder, is a mental health condition. People with DID have two or more separate personalities. And these personalities control their behavior at different times. Each identity has its own personal history, traits, likes, and dislikes. Likes. Now, I do not experience this or know anyone who does, so if I say something or I get something wrong, I apologize in advance. But this is probably the closest thing we can really get to having a real world equivalent to what is going on with Vanny and William, since there are now two personalities inside of Vanny, who each control their own behavior at different times, as we learn in the FNAF AR emails, where Vanessa will go from googling torture and how to induce compliance in human subjects to help and the migration pattern of bees in seemingly no time, literally searching up flowers one day and how far a human being can be cut in half before losing consciousness the next. This seems to be similar to how DID has been documented and described by those who live with it. I mean, I don't mean like the evil part, I mean the split part and the losing time part, at least from what I've read online, which is probably not perfectly accurate. So while these personalities aren't born from the same mind, they certainly share the same space. Both personalities though, while not having separate bodies, would be considered alive since they have DNA and experience cell division and replication even if it's not all the time. So in that way, William is considered alive while present in Vanny's mind, but not alive as his coded form of glitch trap or even if he ends up transferring his code into a robot at the end of Security Breach as has been hinted at with the arm in the end of the gameplay trailer. There we have it friends, is William Afton alive? 
yes and no. Glitch Trap and any future robot with this coded form is not alive, but while present and able to control Vanny or others, yes he is. Of course, this is all in a video game where every version of him is a code, so uh, in our world, he isn't alive. At, at all, and hopefully never will be. Tier 10 Cassidy. Assuming for the scenario that Cassidy is the one you should not have killed, this was one of the dumbest things that William could have done. Or maybe he doesn't consider it a mistake, since the one you should not have killed after all is keeping him alive. They're doing it as a way to make him suffer though, so since it's potentially a mistake but could be considered a good thing depending on the angle, I'm going with the top spot for this one. Well, the first spot for this one. But even if he does consider that a good thing, or an absolute win, or if Cassidy doesn't end up being the one you should not have killed, killing those five kids that made up the missing children's incident that most likely ended with Cassidy was a mistake, since it causes basically everything else in his life to go downhill. And he does end up suffering extremely only because of that kill and the others. So if you don't want to count Cassidy as the mistake, count the missing children's incident as the mistake. And at 9, Charlotte. While yes, Charlotte may have been Afton's first true kill, causing his descent into madness, this is more so because of what she turns into. In the game, Charlotte ends up possessing the puppet, who then gives life to the other animatronics, which causes you to disassemble them and release their spirits, and then scare you into your spring bonnie suit that crushes you, and then starts your descent into further madness. But even discounting the game aspects of killing her, being a mistake, in both universes where William kills Charlotte, Henry comes after him for it, which results in what should be his death multiple times over. And not to mention how in the book specifically, unbeknownst to her, Charlie is an animatronic robot that was meant to replace Henry's daughter, and it's also revealed that the animatronic is also the baby animatronic that we know and love, who can switch between her forms at will. So yeah, in the book Charlotte is also baby, who is also Elizabeth Afton. And it ain't the fun times. There's no doubting what you've achieved on a technical level. These are clearly state of the art. There are just certain design choices that were made for these robots that we don't fully understand. We were hoping you could shed some light on those. She can dance. She can sing. She's equipped with the built-in helium tank for inflating balloons right at her fingertips. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. With all due respect, those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. This classic line of Afton being interrogated that plays the first time you open sister location is definitely showcasing this idiotic mistake. The cops know what these animatronics are capable of and were designed to do, so they instantly end up being even more suspicious of William and are going to be keeping a closer eye on him. Probably why he ends up dressing up in the spring bonnie suit to start killing, which ultimately screws him over. So yeah, designing the fun times as killbots was definitely a bad idea. And it's 7 Hiding Spot. How the absolute living hell did he not end up, like, how did he get away with this? How did he not get caught? The smell of rotting bodies would ruin the hell out of the actual atmosphere of the pizza place, because you know you're supposed to be trying to eat pizza, and the heat from the animatronics, like the, the robotic parts of their body, would help to speed up the decomposition of the ki missing kids. And the animatronics are in front of all those other kids every single day. There's even reports about people complaining that the animatronics started leaking blood, mucus, and other bodily fluids, as well as, quote, smelling like death. If this was real life and William getting away with this wasn't important for the plot or the story of the overall games, he would have been caught for that instantly. <laughs> Like, oh, we never found the bodies of these kids that went missing at this pizza place. But now the animatronics at this pizza place are leaking blood and smell like death. They also sound like their like bones are being crushed when they move. So maybe we should uh maybe we should check these out. Let's get a let's get a warrant. Uh oh, look, turns out we found those missing kids. William Afton, you're under arrest for the murder of Gabriel, Susie, Jeremy, Cassidy, and Fritz. Boom. Oh, then they could probably throw on Charlie and a couple others on there, I'm sure, like boom, <laughs> instantly, he gets caught. I don't get how this wasn't an open and shut case. Like, William is so goddamn stupid that he shouldn't have made it to the events of the first game. Like, not even 1987, or not even 1985, all right? It shouldn't have happened. His whole plan is a dumpster fire of bad ideas. And at six, Henry. Why did you think that killing Charlotte wouldn't have any consequences? Like, you killed your business partner's daughter, that's gonna be pretty obvious to him. Especially when he already suspected you were up to something. So he took extra care to protect his daughter, and she still died. That's a vengeful father if I have ever heard of one. And he hasn't even needed vengeance yet. So then, you know, he's after you. Or seems like it, and you, you don't kill him next. Killing Henry could have done wonders for your criminal career. 
I mean, like, yeah, the cops are already suspicious, but as long as they can't find a body, you'll be clear again. If they won't put you away for five missing kids, they won't put you away for a missing father as well. Especially a jury who has to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that you are a killer. And without a body, there's no real forensic evidence. And again, they didn't put you away for the missing kids, so you just finally off Henry and then you'd be able to stage yourself or even a spring trap, alright? And then you don't get burned like three separate times, and Michael would still be alive. Halfway through in at number five, Elizabeth. Speaking of mistakes, <laughs> let's talk about his daughter. <laughs> What about getting your own kid killed? That's what I mean. Like, I don't know how William thought that this was a good idea. Like, I feel like this guy just thought, like, how do I capture kids more efficiently? Oh, I know, I can make a robot to lure them in and then grab them when they're close. But like, hmm, what would its design be? Hmm, hey honey, come here, daddy wants some design tips. And then Elizabeth ends up making the most predictable move ever and going directly against her father's instructions to see the robot that's basically perfect in her eyes. Like, William. Why did you think that this was ever going to end well? Like, what did you think was going to happen? When has a kid ever listened to a parent? Especially at that age, when they're seemingly also loaded because you own a successful entertainment business. Spoiled rich kids listening to their dad when they say not to touch a giant robot made to appeal to them specifically? Yeah, genius f***ing idea, man. God, you're a real special kind of stupid, William, aren't you? Like, program a blacklist of kids not to steal, right? You have facial recognition tech, so come on. Just make a blacklist, like, don't kill my kids. Easy. God. And for Crying Child. I've had a ton of people complain to me about how Crying Child's death wasn't William's fault, since he didn't put Crying Child in Fredbear's mouth, and the spring locks failing were because he was crying. However, to me, there is no logical way that the animatronic jaw should have been able to crush his skull, okay? The spring locks were already active, crushing his skull would require a lot of power to actually accomplish with just a normal opening and closing. Of, the, of an animatronic mouth, so the only way that Crying Child's skull could have been crushed was if Afton had intentionally supercharged the animatronic, which would make sense if he wanted to use it as a kill machine or a backup kill suit maybe if uh, Spring Trap or Spring Bonnie ever ended up shutting down. Figuring more power would help him out, which clearly it did, just in the worst way possible. There is no way that this was a spring lock failure either, okay? The Fredbear suit was already in animatronic mode, meaning that the spring lock mechanism used to keep the robot parts to the side of the suit so that someone could be in the suit weren't being used. The spring lock failure problem comes from when those mechanisms are put under the stress of keeping the parts away from the person in the suit. If it's in robot mode, the spring locks can't fail because they're not being used. Keep in mind that the term spring lock in this context is referring to the actual parts that move the robot bits away inside the suit, rather than just the suit as a whole, which is also referred to as a spring lock. Well, it's referred to as a spring lock suit, okay? If I was talking about the suit, I would say spring lock suit. Getting close to the end in at number three, Princess Quest. The whole reason Princess Quest is a thing in, in the Security Breach was to lock Vanny away and prevent her from regaining control of her body. So, why did William create or allow for the creation of a sort of failsafe that would let her escape? I mean, sure, they didn't expect a kid to come along and figure it out, maybe, but given the track record of this series, you'd think that Afton would have smartened up at a, after at least 40 years. But that's like having a self-destruct button on a bomb that you plan to use to wipe out the entire city, but you still want no one to stop you. Or like if the Flash had a steal my speed button on his suit that you could just like tap. It's just stupid. Like, if you want something to work, why give it a way to fail, you know? This is one of the dumbest things that William has done, and probably the third dumbest thing overall. And I'll talk about the, the most dumb in a, in a couple minutes, but seriously, what's the point behind a way to undo your evil plans? One of the absolute most ridiculous things in this story. Like, I get it, so that we can save her and have a good ending, but that ending isn't even canon, so we could have done without it. It's, it's just, it's one of the dumbest things known to, to man at this point. Like, William has the brain capacity of a toddler. But ultimately, in a number two, Springtrap. Being the genius behind some of the most advanced robotic technology in his universe, we expect a lot from William Afton. He's the suit technician, but he's also the main killer, so he should really know what he's doing, right? <laughs> no. Apparently not, since after discovering that the original five animatronics were possessed, he disassembled them to learn their secrets. 
This inadvertently released the spirits of his original five victims, however, causing William to panic, which is fairly reasonable since, firstly, they're freaking ghost kids, and also because they're ghost kids that he killed. So, this absolute animatronic genius, the technician that handles the suit maintenance and has explained to every employee the proper procedure for the spring lock suits, including the spring body suit that he uses to kill, ends up climbing inside the suit in a panic, in an attempt to make himself feel more powerful and maybe to scare the ghost kids off. However, since he's so smart, he didn't notice the moisture of the room, the leaking ceiling, which ended up causing the spring locks that were active at this moment, since it was in suit mode, to fail. Which would have killed him had he not been possessed by the one you should not have killed. Ironic. And finally, in a number one, location, location, location. The biggest mistake William has ever made, and I will stand by this till the day I die, was the fact that he killed people in his establishment. Okay, it's unknown if this was always his intention, but come on, who the absolute hell thinks that this is a good idea? Who in the comments wants to justify killing your prime demographic in your place of business? Dealers don't kill their best customers, right? Because it's bad for business. So why would William think it's a good idea? Literally, go anywhere else. This is like basically killing someone in your house. Okay, it's putting unwanted and unneeded scrutiny on everything you do. You even end up getting banned from going back in there while the investigation is underway. And it's not like it helped your business. You had to close the first location, resulting in you having to open another location called Circus Babies that ended up killing your daughter. So I think that this mistake is the one that caused every other mistake in the series. All you had to do was kill someone at the park. <laughs> If you killed someone at the park instead, your kids would be alive. You'd be harder to suspect, and then you'd also be rich from your business. And that's why William is a dumbass. In a 10, animatronics. We can joke all we want about how Afton has a hardcore bloodlust in this series, but his desire for human destruction has been there since the start. Thanks to the fast facts found in FNAF AR's files, we learned that the Funtime robots, the ones used in Sister Location, were actually some of the first robots Afton ever made. Not exactly the first, but among the first. And that they were built with special containment chambers inside to store away items, which we all know is code for children's storage tanks, which we see the Funtimes actually have in their blueprints from FNAF 6. So, this means that Afton has been wanting to kill kids since before his kids had died. Hell, even maybe before his kids were born, depending on the timeline. Which at this point is as simple as my feelings for Vanessa, which is not simple at all. If anyone like cosplays Vanessa, feel free to hit me up on Instagram. Possibly killed wife. This hasn't been confirmed as of yet, so it's currently not canon. Many people still consider William Afton offing his wife to be the story of her demise, even though technically we know nothing about her. And she could still be alive for all we know. Many people consider her to have died in either a car crash or because William killed her, and those are like the most common thoughts on the matter. Although the her dying in a car accident thing came from like a, a FNAF original music video that was probably using Minecraft characters, that is in no way canon to the series. Like I've had people yell at me in my DMs telling me that it's canon that she died in a car accident, but no, it's not. It's not even canon that she died, really. But the potential is still there that William was the reason she kicked the animatronic parts filled bucket. Since it's only a possibility though, it's only number 9. If it gets confirmed, I'm more than willing to bump it up higher. Because like statistically speaking, your spouse is the person most likely to kill you, so she should have been on her guard. And it ain't missing children's incident. I mean, this is a fairly low hanging fruit since it's like the inciting moment for the whole series, but I think it's worth calling out at at least number 8. The missing children's incident, in case you forgot, is the infamous incident where 5 kids go missing inside of Freddy Fazbear's pizza and are never seen again. Police investigated but were never able to find the bodies, thus they had to let their suspect, in this case William Afton, go due to a lack of evidence. However, this is one of the most horrifically painful moments that you can think of, especially if you're a parent yourself. Five families went into Freddy Fazbear's wanting their kids to have the time of their lives in 1985, but left without their favorite people. They had the time of their lives, alright, it just so happened to also be the end of their lives. And not only that, but Afton ends up getting away with it since the police were terrible at their jobs or were getting paid off. Still not sure which one is the case in this series, but the missing children's incident is one of the most messed up things to ever happen in this series, but without it we wouldn't have the series. At least it's all fake, right? 
and in 7 stored his daughter. While we know Afton isn't the best father, I think it's something else to end up locking your robot possessed by the soul of your dead daughter into an animatronic testing facility. That seems a bit too far if you ask for my humble opinion. But nevertheless, he still did it, and that's what Sister Location is all about. And William was even the one who sent us as Michael down there in the first place, and then we get shoved full of entered bits so that they can escape. Did William know about that plan? Unsure, because like in FNAF 6, Baby says that she'll make her dad proud. So was that William's intention to like send us down there so baby could get out? And if that was the case, why lock her down in there in the first place? I mean like if she was your daughter, why not have her just like chill around the house, right? Like in the books, baby is able to transform between baby and like a human looking animatronic at will. So why not add this to that version, and then you can have your daughter back, albeit a little more messed up. But like more like you in the long run, right? I don't know. This family has messed the hell up and nothing makes sense. And it's 6 later that night. The Midnight Motorist minigame seems simple enough, but the true horror of this minigame comes from the implications of it, since in the game files the minigame is known as Later That Night. Most people akin the game to what happened after William kills Charlotte outside Fredder's Family Diner in FNAF 2's Take Cake minigame. But if this is true, this is probably one of the scariest moments in all of FNAF history. This man just killed someone, but then goes home to his kids, reprimands his son and abuses him by locking him in his room so much that he had to break his window to escape. Plus. Think of all the people driving past him, unaware of the violent crime that he had just committed. It's scary because this is the case in the real world too. Technically speaking, anyone we encounter can be a serial killer. And that is a horrific thought since also you're only alive because everyone you've ever encountered has chosen not to kill you. Which only makes the whole anyone could be a serial killer thing even worse. And in this case, this man literally just killed someone and then comes home and is going to yell at his son who's been in his room all day. Like god damn bro, how much residual anger do you have? Have suppressed inside your body. Halfway through into number 5, Vanessa. Possessing Vanessa was certainly one of the more messed up things that William did. It just sounds weird, you know? Like this guy pops up into your VR headset and takes over your body without your consent so now you end up killing for him. That's kind of messed up. Actually, no, not kind of, that's incredibly messed up. I mean, she knows what's going on too. She actively talks in hushed tones about how she can't talk about it to her therapist. So like, what the hell is the dynamic here? I mean, possessing someone is already pretty messed up, but then causing them to make a rabbit costume so you're still a furry is a whole other set of kings that I don't even want to talk about. And then, she knows that there's an evil inside her, but she can't do anything about it. She fears for her life, which only makes me wonder what William has been saying to her. And she's now, with full knowledge of her darker half, willing to lock a kid in a lost and found room until the police arrive, despite never calling the police, and then lets that darker half track him down. And in 4, lied about Remnant. Now, this isn't confirmed, much like the fact that he possibly killed his wife. However, this seems like the most likely explanation to me. So if you want a full explanation as to why I think Afton was the one who lied about Remnant, go check out that video linked up in the iCard. But, I'm going to wrap this up quickly here. Basically, there have been three fires so far that were meant to finish off William Afton, and none of them have worked. The reason Henry tried fire was because that's supposed to be the thing that can burn off Remnant. However, Remnant can also be found in liquid form, so how can it be molten but also be burnt by by fire. It makes more sense that William made up the lie that he could be killed by fire so Henry would keep trying and failing to kill him so he wouldn't have to worry about actually dying. Since literally every time he's been caught in a fire he has survived. And the other animatronics infused with Remnant also survived like Baby, the puppet, and entered in FNAF 6 as we see from the blob in Security Breach. Getting close to the end in at number 3, Stuffed. One of the most deranged things that William Afton did was stuff the bodies of the original 5 missing children into the original 5 animatronics. Animatronics, Bonnie, Foxy, Freddy, Chica, and Golden Freddy. And the craziest part is that he didn't get caught for it. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. The animatronics smelt like death, started leaking blood and other fluids, and the police didn't bat an eye. He put these bodies in animatronics that perform for other kids and their parents every single day. How does anyone think that that's a good idea? Unless it was his way of displaying his kills or something, like some of the crime shows like to mention. How some killers enjoy the world knowing what they did, since it helps them feel more powerful or something, fuels their ego. Like maybe even if they didn't know that the bodies were there, William could be using that as an ego boost, which is messed up. And also ruins the whole he did it because his kids were dying theory, aside from the whole him killing before his kids died thing. Also, how did the police not confiscate the animatronics for evidence? Penultimately, in a number two, for 
first victim. They say a killer's first victim is the most important, since it usually indicates what got them to start killing or other psychological clues that they could use to predict his next moves. But in the case of William Afton, his first victim was the daughter of his longtime business partner Henry, which is hella messed up because she was three at the time, that time being 1983. And this is the year that Afton's life started going downhill in the worst ways possible. He starts killing off kids and then sticks with that MO throughout the rest of his criminal career. But the fact that his first victim was someone who trusted him, who didn't exactly suspect him even though her father did, is something even I fear. I'm not a parent, so I can only imagine how this must have felt. And if that was me, I'd be doing a lot more than burning down restaurants in an attempt to put that down. I'd be doing it myself, especially if he had killed my daughter when she was only three years old. Like, I can feel the rage brewing and I don't even have someone that I could, in theory, make a daughter with. And finally, in a number one, killed his kids. The worst thing that Afton has done by far is gotten his own kids killed. Sure, he may not have done it directly, but his actions ended up resulting in all three of his kids' demises. Him killing Charlotte got Fred Bear's clothes which resulted in him having to open up circus babies, which made him have to dust off Baby and the other fun times, which were designed to kill in the first place. Baby ends up grabbing and crushing Elizabeth, resulting in her possessing the animatronic. He superpowered the jaw of the Fredbear animatronic used in the new Freddy Fazbear's, which ends up crushing his youngest son's skull, since that was not a springlock failure, due to all the springlocks being active, since it was in animatronic mode, not suit mode. So there was nothing to fail, meaning that he had to have been crushed by the power of his jaw. And while you could argue that it was Michael's fault, why would he think that Fredbear's mouth was overpowered? As the suit technician, William knew what was going on and intentionally souped up the jaw power. And then he gets Michael killed when he sends him down to find his sister in sister location, which ends up getting him stuffed with innards and then letting himself burn in Pizzeria Simulator. So yeah, William's actions got all three of his kids killed just because he had to kill his business partner's daughter. I've gone on and on about how stupid William Afton is and how he could have been doing just a couple things to be more difficult to capture or even maybe impossible. But just how would these things have made him a better villain? And what would have happened if William Afton was actually smart? That's what we're exploring today. Let's do it. Location. The location of the various crimes does actually factor into its effectiveness, believe it or not. The idea that William was killing in his own Fazbear restaurants is a ridiculous concept that in reality should have gotten him sent to prison. The saying is something along the lines of like don't crap where you eat, which some take literally, others take as don't date people you see on a regular basis, and in this scenario I suggest that it should mean don't kill people where you're seen on a regular basis or, you know, constantly because it's your own business, especially if it's the business that like targets kids. And while yes, this this doesn't instantly make you guilty, but um, come on, the first thing that anyone would do in this situation, not even a cop, would be question everyone who was working when whatever had happened, happened, or whoever it was disappeared. And let's be realistic, an incident the likes of the missing children's incident from 1985 would ruin a business permanently. None of this somehow they stay open bullshit because in the real world they would end up closing permanently because no parent would want to go to a place where five kids went missing, especially when no bodies were found, which could maybe help them, but it certainly wouldn't help much. If Afton had any competitors, any at all, right? Even this world's version of Chuck E. Cheese, Afton should have gone there if he had any competitors, or literally anywhere else would have made more sense. However, he chose to kill where he eats, and that's probably one of the worst decisions that he could have made. Well, the, aside from, you know, the killing in the first place. Animatronics. While the animatronics are an entirely other mistake, this time around I want to talk about how stupid it was to hide the bodies in the animatronics. Like, how the f***? Did he end up getting away with this? The smell of rotting bodies would already ruin the place, especially when its focus is eating pizza. The heat from the animatronics animatronic insides would speed up decomposition, and the animatronics are in front of people every single day. They even started complaining that they were leaking blood and mucus, as well as smelling like death. If this was real, and William getting away with it wasn't important for the plot, 
He would have been caught instantly. Oh, we never found the bodies of these kids, but now these animatronics are leaking blood and smell like death. Hell, they even make bone crushing sounds when they move. We should probably check this out. Oh look, turns out we found those missing kids. William Afton, you're under arrest for the murder of Cassidy, Fritz, Jeremy, Gabriel, Susie. Boom! Instantly! I don't know how this wasn't an open and shut case. Straight up, William was so goddamn stupid that he shouldn't have made it to the first game. Not to mention how stupid he was by building the fun time animatronics with these item containment chambers as he was calling it. Since the cops ended up questioning him about why he made those design choices in the sister location opening scene. Plus, he super powered the jaw of Fredbear from Fredbear's family diner to end up giving it a jaw that accidentally killed his son. Absolute moron. William, not the son. It wasn't his fault that he got his head shoved in there. If he had put it in there himself, it would have been his fault, but he didn't. Enemies. Now, while William did choose a set of easy marks, since, you know, kids can't really defend themselves against a dude in a part animatronic furry suit, but he he's a moron for exclusively killing that demographic only. I don't know why he did that. Sure, it's easier on him, especially when he's fully combined with an animatronic, but Henry serves as the opposition to William, and the reason William ends up burning multiple times. It's not Henry's fault that he turned into Springtrap, but it's certainly his fault that he turned into Scrap Trap, since this is most likely due to the FNAF 3 fire, and the FNAF 6 fire turned him into Burn Trap. So Henry has definitely been a pain in William's side for ages. Killing Henry would have resulted in nobody being able to chase William, basically. Like Michael might have figured it out, but he wouldn't really be in a position to do anything without Henry. Henry gave him the FNAF 3 job probably, and definitely gave him the FNAF 6 job, so if William had just offed Henry after offing his daughter, he would have had a much easier time. At least. I'd think so. That's why every comic villain wants to kill the hero, right? Because if they do, they'll have a much easier time committing all their various crimes. So how is this any different? It shouldn't be. William is an absolute buffoon for not killing Henry when he had the chance. I'm sure it was Henry reporting him to the cops, like, you killed this man's daughter. Of course he's gonna have some form of vendetta against your ass. He's coming for blood, and he actively tries to kill you multiple times. That's not something that you should have just ignored. <laughs> you should have just killed Henry after his daughter. Because honestly, it makes sense. Then you kill his wife, or the mother of Charlotte, as long as she's in the picture, knows about it, and actually cares, because sometimes they don't. But mom's gonna go after anyone who wronged their child, okay? Oh, that's something to witness, I'm telling you. Even my mom is vicious as hell, and she's like the sweetest woman in the world. So, you, you just get rid of the family, alright? Especially when it's your business partner. God, you're stupid. And while William may never have been caught for these acts, that's simply because he couldn't get caught or the plot would make no sense. So ultimately, the game had to find an excuse for his ridiculous behavior. But William could have done wonders if he had just been slightly more intelligent and maybe actually thought about things. Killing kids in your own pizzeria is horrible for business, so do that somewhere else, okay? If he had, he wouldn't have hid the bodies in the animatronics, which would have prevented the kids from attaching their souls to the animatronics that they were stuffed into. Thus, William wouldn't have had to disassemble assemble them, which accidentally released their souls, causing him to hide in his spring trap suit. The spring body suit would have failed without him inside, thus preventing spring trap from being created. And William wouldn't have been sealed behind a wall for 30 years. During those 30 years, he'd still be possessed by the one you should not have killed, since they didn't latch onto an animatronic in the first place, they latched onto him, and he'd be unable to properly die still. 
but he'd have an extra 30 years to work on bringing his kid back to life. He wouldn't have needed to send Michael to get baby from Afton Robotics' storage facility, and Michael would have ended up fine. Fazbear Frights wouldn't have opened, resulting in the place never burning down, and the FNAF 6 game wouldn't have needed to take place. There would have been no need to repair the company image in FNAF VR, William would have been probably a millionaire, and he could have used that money to study ways to bring his son back. Perhaps discovering Remnant along the way, similar to how Henry created the Ella doll in the novels. William could have poured his grief into something, watched it become possessed, and then worked on recreating that in a robot version of his dead children. If his children even died anyway. Since Fazbear's wouldn't have closed, he wouldn't have needed to open circus babies, resulting in Elizabeth staying alive. And since Crying Child wouldn't have seen her get scooped, he wouldn't fear the animatronics. Thus Michael not needing to put his head in the Fredbear mouth because he thought it was funny, because he, his brother was scared. His brother wouldn't have been scared, so Michael wouldn't have needed to do that. William also just wouldn't have supercharged Fredbear's jaw, so even if Crying Child did get his head in there, which again, I guess would technically be possible, he still wouldn't have died because of it. All of this simply goes back to William's first mistake, which was choosing to kill people in his own establishment. If that first kill also wasn't his business partner's daughter, nobody would have been suspicious of him, and everything would have have gone his way. Okay? Afton is smart, however he could have been a lot smarter at the start, which would have resulted in him having an easy time on his killing spree, but I guess that would make for a very interesting game series, would it? There we have it friends, what if William Afton was smart? Again, it's these kinds of videos that will put me on some form of watch list or will prevent me from going into the states. Uh, well, I guess uh, some of us need to make sacrifices so we can hate on fictional characters for being morons, am I right? <laughs> Uh, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all so much for watching. I have been in Shower Me, Gonna Monroe, and I'll see you in another video.